thanks for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Jeff Houston. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a retired Wadsworth Police Sergeant. I'm a retired U.S. Army Reserve Major. I deployed to Iraq twice, Bosnia once, and Afghanistan once. Uh, I've been interested in the Civil War for probably as long as I can remember, and uh, I've been reenacting a lot longer than the war went on. <laughs> a lot longer. Uh, I probably first got interested in it when I was a little boy. My dad showed me this picture of this little old lady and her daughter and her daughter and her daughter, who was my grandmother. And my grandmother was about three or four years old. And the little old lady was the widow of an Ohio soldier named Wagner who had died at Andersonville Prison. That's all I knew, didn't know anything else about it. Uh, wasn't able to research it all that well. A few years ago, my wife and I went to the site of Andersonville Prison, which is the National POW Museum. And in the roster of Ohio soldiers, the database that they have online, uh, there's Jonathan Wagner, one Wagner from Ohio, uh, from the 93rd Ohio. He was captured at Chickamauga in September of 1863 and he died at Andersonville of diarrhea in September of 1864. And that's all I know. And, uh, but it just kind of proved the, uh, uh, you, you know, what my dad was telling me was, you know, I'll take it that, uh, that uh, that's my family Wagner. So, uh, but, uh, but anyways, tonight, what I'd like to talk to you about a little bit is not so much generals and you know, battles and, and all that kind of thing, because you get all that, you know all that, most of you do. What I'd like to talk to you about is the common ordinary life of a private Union soldier. Now, we reenact the 5th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, which is from Cincinnati. Why the unit picked Cincinnati, I don't know. But I'm a private, and if the higher ups pick the 5th Ohio, then yes, sir. So. Uh, but uh, actually, it's pretty common, it's pretty standard what I'm going to do for, for most northern soldiers. And a lot of this even pertains to southern soldiers. I mean, a lot of it's kind of the same. Yeah, there's differences, but a lot of it's the same in soldiers throughout the north. Now, if you have an idea of not just Wadsworth, but the entire Western Reserve and the impact that the Civil War had here, drive through Woodlawn Cemetery sometime. I hate to say this, but every once in a while when, when nights were kind of slow and I didn't have anything going on at the PD, I would drive through the cemetery and I'd look for Civil War tombstones. Well, there's the second, there's uh, <coughs> from the 2nd Ohio Cavalry, the 29th Ohio Infantry, the 32nd Ohio Infantry, the 67th Ohio Infantry, the 103rd Ohio Infantry, the 87th Pennsylvania, uh, I think, uh, the 9th Pennsylvania Artillery. Uh, there's actually one soldier there from the 115th Illinois who died of wounds received at the Battle of Nashville in December of 1864. Now that's one story I'd like to know. How did this soldier come to be buried in Wadsworth Cemetery? So, so if you have that, you know, if you, if you think it, that, you know, it's just, it didn't have an impact here, obviously it did. Uh, I grew up in Lodi. There were two houses in Lodi that are still standing and occupied today that my dad pointed out to me were stops on the Underground Railroad. So, um, so you know, this being part of the Western Reserve, it was settled by those from New England, and so it was probably more abolitionist than the rest of the state. If you got down in Southern Ohio, you had people that were not abolitionists by a long shot. And were, were actually kind of not necessarily pro-Confederate sympathizers, but uh, were by no means concerned about abolition or anything like that. And in fact, the vast majority of Northern soldiers weren't either, not till the war kept going on, and they saw that when slaves were taken away from the South, it hurt their war effort. So they became by a war measure, which the Emancipation Proclamation was, it became good for the war effort to free the slaves. So, but that's just a, a 
just kind of general knowledge. What I'm here to talk to you today about is the is kind of a day in the life of a Union soldier. I'm going to explain everything I got on. I'm going to explain how to load and fire this thing without actually firing it. I'm going to explain the rations, explain some of the life, the time off, and everything else. Now, what I'm wearing right now is probably what a soldier would have worn when he was on the march. I am carrying everything that an infantry private would carry. And then, you know, and probably, probably more so because whatever I'm going to use, I have to carry. So I have to decide in my mind, do I really need that? Because after a while carrying this stuff, it gets heavy. It gets heavy, you know, just a little bit. So, but, so what I have here is my blanket, just a plain standard wool blanket that I could either roll and put on the top of my pack, which is on my back, or I could loop it and roll here. Now, if I was to go into battle, a lot of times soldiers would get rid of their packs and the, the, the unit would, would leave them all in one place and you come back and get them later and you would keep your blanket with you. So I'm gonna kind of strip down just because standing up here, it does get heavy. So, and my hat, I'm sure what you're used to seeing is a cap like this. This is what you're used to seeing, okay? Now, in the Civil War, there was kind of a distinction between the Army of the Potomac, which is the, in the eastern part of the, of the war, and the Army of the Tennessee, the Army of the Cumberland, which was the western part that fought Atlanta and so on and Mississippi and all that. So a lot of soldiers out <coughs> west would buy hats like these. Because one, they liked how they looked. They just like, it looks good. Second of all, it keeps the rain off you, keeps the sun off you a little bit, a little better than this one does. Okay. So now, portraying the 5th Ohio, they were in the eastern part of the war till after Gettysburg. Then they went west and, and participated in the battles around Atlanta and the march to the sea. So it could have very well been that they wore this for a while, but a lot of them ended up wearing something like this. So, so either way, either one is good. Now, in reenacting, sometimes we per portray a certain unit and we'll wear certain <coughs> articles of clothing, but for our purposes right now, I'm just gonna leave that one on. So, so it's just a plain wool blanket. You can see right here, it's actually government issue. It says US, it's got US stamped on it. So it was provided by the government. Now this pack that uh, a Civil War soldier was issued, and we'll go into uh, what he might have carried in it in a little bit, but I carried, in my, I went into the military in 1975, and I didn't retire until 2014. And in the interim, I've carried a lot of packs. Now, I've never carried one quite as uncomfortable as this one. <laughs> and one of the reasons being, if you see right here where you see these straps that go over my shoulder, that metal digs right into my shoulder. And it is, uh, it, I mean, just standing here for 15 minutes was painful. You can imagine marching mile after mile after mile with something like that. So a lot of times what the soldiers would do, everything that went in here, they would roll up in their blanket and they'd throw this away. So, but anyway, but that's, you know, that, that's just one of those things that it just, <coughs> again, it's particularly aggravating, particularly aggravating. So going into battle, a soldier would have had this uniform on, okay? Now, this uniform equates to the camouflage uniforms that our military wears today. It's not a dress uniform, it's a fatigue, a work, uh, a in the field uniform, okay? So it, it there's other uniforms. Uh, a lot of uh, soldiers wore Zulab uniforms, which had 
red pants and short blue jackets and all kinds of things and you know had a nice fez on top well they got uh, they got just as muddy and dirty as everything else and the way the regiments were raised back then is the vast majority of them were, were raised by the states the states enlisted the soldiers and then turned them over to the federal government and, and they were volunteers Ohio volunteers Pennsylvania so on like that because at one point in the Civil War, the, the U.S. Army numbered over a million men. At the start of the Civil War, the, the U.S. Army numbered about 16,000 men. And don't forget, they were like out west, you know, what's now Washington State, uh, Montana. It, they were all over in very, very small units. So that's how they were raised. And a lot of sol soldiers were enlisted by their states, in fact, the vast majority. Now, there were U.S. Army soldiers, regular soldiers, but they were enlisted by the federal government. And so the soldiers would have been issued this as a work uniform. Okay. Now, the shirt I have on, the, the U.S. government did issue <coughs> wool shirts, wool drawers, wool socks, everything. But of course, you wear those every day, they kind of wear out. Well, I happen to be lucky enough that my darling wife at home <coughs> sent me a package and sent me this beautiful homespun shirt in, in a package that she mailed to me. So I'm very fortunate she did that because my Uncle Sam's shirt had, uh, had uh, gone to uh, <coughs> tatters. I, I use it to clean my rifle. So. But the trousers that I have on are called sky blue, and the vast majority of infantry soldiers wore light blue trousers back then. They weren't dark blue, they were, they were issued light blue, light blue trousers. Wool, standard wool socks, brown, gray, whatever. And the shoes I have on are called brogans, or in the vernacular of the day, brogans. And if you can see up front, you can see on the heel, there's a heel plate there, which makes it really nice for making noise. But I don't know if anybody's heard me walking in here on a floor like this. I'm kind of tippy-toeing, because when it gets wet on concrete or wood or something like that. But those are, those are the shoes that uh, a Civil War infantryman would wear, and they, those were issued by the government. In fact, this was one of the first times that in mass production, they actually made left shoes and right shoes. Before this, this time, they would kind of make shoes, and it was kind of up to your feet to fit them, you know. <laughs> Where, your feet are going to form these shoes. You're, eventually, you'll have a left shoe and a right shoe. Now, it might hurt while that's happening, but you'll get one. One of each, so that that will happen. So now you see my belt buckle; it says U.S. Okay, so this is a this is a belt issued by the federal government. But over my left shoulder, on my right hip, is my cartridge box, and there are 40 rounds in a cartridge box. And on my cartridge box, you will see the plate that says OVM. Anybody have an idea what that stands for? Ohio Volunteer, Ohio Volunteer Militia. Yep, Ohio Volunteer Militia. Because that's who you were enlisted as, and again, how you were offered to service for the federal government. Now, each regiment from each state had a national colors, the US flag, and then they had a regimental flag. And sometimes regimental flags were different than what you see in standard army units today, standard regimental flags, they were different. So, but this is my cartridge box. Sometimes you'll see a cartridge box that's right attached to the belt. Your combat load, in other words, the ammunition you carry was 40 rounds. You would carry 40 rounds in your cartridge box. And we'll get into loading and firing the musket here in a little bit. So on my belt here, this is my cap box. My percussion caps go in here because to fire this thing it takes things out of here and it takes things out of here 
So it's a, it's a process, and we'll, we'll go over that. So, oh, I forgot to mention, at any time you got a question, go ahead and ask. Don't, I mean, I'm gonna explain everything, but if you got a question, you know, far away. So, not literally, but, <laughs> but go ahead and ask. So, so go ahead and ask. So, and right here is my bayonet. Now, in thinking of Civil War combat, you think a lot of it is up close. You think of it as a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, the rifle that I carry is actually a rifle. So that means inside the barrel is rifle. This weapon is accurate to three to 400 yards. So there was not as much hand-to-hand -hand combat as you might expect. Now, now, when you go to reenactments, if you go to a Civil War reenactment today, you'll see that they're pretty close. That's because we just don't have the room or the distance or anything like that. But it's kind of historically inaccurate because most of the weapons that they used once they got into, especially mass production and so on like that, were accurate to three to 400 yards. So, you know, and a lot of people you know, using rifles was a way of life with them. So they knew how to shoot back then. So. That brings up a question. Yes, sir. Didn't you have uh, telescopic sights or okay, anything now, to see that far away? Some units, there were some units of sharpshooters that had telescopic sights, but usually not. The reason being that that a sniper rifle, you know, like we could, it was so big and heavy that they couldn't really deploy them in great numbers. So, uh, so yes, there were some, but not many, not many. Now, a lot of units made like a, their own companies of sharpshooters, but they were probably usually armed with this. Now, the, the US sharpshooters, there were two regiments, were armed with a sharps rifle, but it's still a single shot rifle, it's just not a muzzle load like this one. What was the Civil War designation for that type of rifle? This is a rifle musket, okay? And it's in 1861, the year of its manufacture, is Springfield. So it's, you know, an 1861 rifle musket. So musket, you know, pertains to the having to load it from the muzzle. And then rifle, that it's a rifle and not a smoothbore weapon, which so many of them were, you know, back in the, even, you know, Back in, all the tactics were based off of Napoleon. He was the guy everybody studied. So it was based off of him. So what they did was they uh, based the tactics that, which was great, but a smoothbore is accurate to like 75 yards. Well, this thing's accurate to 400 yards. And that's why you see so many you know guys lined up shoulder to shoulder and so on like that. So, and this right here, my canteen, you can see you know, there's a little bit it's uh, called a bullseye canteen. Uh, it just, it, you know, you got your water back then where you could find it. Don't forget, back then there was no such things as, what, what's bacteria? What's a germ? They didn't know. They didn't know. Uh, Pasteur and Whisker didn't discover all this stuff until the 1870s. So they didn't know. There's an interesting vignette in uh, Glory Road which is a trilogy by Bruce Catton. Uh, he's telling the, uh, a Union soldier kneeling by a muddy hoof print and spooning enough water into his cup to boil coffee. So, so you, you got water wherever you could get it. You know, there was no bottled water, obviously. There was no uh, water buffaloes, you, you know, that kind of thing. This right here, is my haversack. This is what contains my food rations, and we'll show you that in a little bit. This is a, it's called a mucket. This is what I would boil my coffee in or make, uh, you know, make a little soup or something like that. But usually it was used to boil your coffee. So, and just think, if you're using that kind of water and you would just plain drink it, if you didn't boil your coffee, I mean, more people might have died from that. And, you know, coffee in the, in the, nor the Northern armies were, was very, very important. It was what, 
probably one of the best rations that a soldier got. But we'll go over the rations here in a minute. Um, with my my rifle here, this right here is called a Tompion. So many things were had French names back then simply because, again, Napoleon was the man back then. And all that does, I keep the rain up. That's all it does. That's all it's for. Keep the rain up. Now, to load this thing, very, very complicated procedure. The position of the tension is like this. The command would be loaded nine times load. And I don't know if it's exactly nine times if I got the command right, but I'm close. Load, loaded nine times load. You would put your rifle here in front of you to go here. The first command would be handle cartridge. And you would take, your cartridge was, was self-contained in here. You, there's gunpowder, there's a piece of wadding, and then there's the bullet. It would be handle cartridge, and you put it up here. The tear cartridge, and you have to tear it with your teeth. The medical exams weren't all that good in the Civil War when you went in, but one thing they did check to see if you had teeth. <laughs> Two reasons. One to tear the cartridge, and one to eat hardtack. And we'll get into eating hardtack here in a minute. Well, so tear cartridge, charge cartridge. The powder would go down, the water would go down, and the bullet would go down facing up. So not a round. bullet round? No, and I got one, I'll pass it around and take a look at it. So you do that, and then it's draw rammer. Bring it up halfway, and soldiers were drilled, you had to spin it over your left shoulder. Remember, there's a guy here, there's a guy here, there's a guy behind me, there's a guy behind him. So if we just decide we're gonna take his rammer right out any old way, you know, there's gonna be an eyeball stuck on the end of it. So draw rammer. So, and then it's ram cartridge. Ram it all the way down, all the way here, and return rammer. <laughs> and when you return your rammer, you always put it down next to your pinky. Because once you start firing this thing, this thing gets hot. I mean, it gets hot. Of course, all we do is fire powder in it, but it gets hot. And if you're not careful, we don't even draw very much up here. It's a safety issue, getting reenacted. But if it's hot and you're going down like this, and <laughs> that powder ignites, you know, you just lost your hand. So, and then the command would be prime. And you would, you would bring your rifle here, you would grab a cap here, and this is what a cap looked like, right here, a little cap. It would be prime, and you put put the cap right here on, on the nipple. Okay, now, and then the command would be ready, aim, fire. Now, your rifle, the hammer had three positions. There, it's all the way down. Here is called half cock. Called half cock. Just pull the trigger. Won't go off, will No, just safety. It's a safety. Anybody ever heard the phrase going off half cock? Yeah. Where do you think it comes from? Oh, no. It comes from this. Because if your rifle went off at half cock, that means there was something mechanically wrong with it. Okay. And when we inspect we do safety inspections before every reenactment battle. We check that. We check that. And then right here, and it goes all the way down. Okay. So a good soldier could get off two to three well-aimed shots a minute. Now, don't forget, the guys on the other side are shooting back at you. So there's this weapon is very, very hard to load as it is. There is actually a protocol or a, a, a drill where you load it laying in the prone position. You turn around on your back, you put your rifle here, and you do here, and then you load it this way. And then 
to fire it, you've got to roll back over, cap it, and fire it. But you can load this from the front, it's just, and I've done it in reenactments a few times, and yeah, you, but again, depending on the cover you have. So, but that, that's what it took to load it. Now, we talked about your bayonet. Your bayonet would go on like that. And if you can see, you can fire it with your bayonet on. It just makes it heavy. It just makes it, uh, you know, a little, little less unsteady. Yes, sir. When you were mentioning how hot the barrel got, mm -hmm. when you would fire that a number of times, did they have problems when you went to load it? They sure with did. With the gunpowder? Sure did. Good question. Good question. Did they have problems loading it? Absolutely. Absolutely. You had, again, remember I said we had 40 rounds, and you got your rounds in packages of 10, called an arsenal pack. And in that 10 rounds, there was one, the rounds were in like kind of tan, like paper bag kind of color or lighter color, but one round was in blue paper. And that was your cleaning round. That was, it was extra lubrication to help clean it out. But yes, there were instances where soldiers would fire and it would get to be so foul with powder that they have to beat the ramrod down to load it occasionally if they were in sustained, a sustained fire fight. So yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it was it was not easy to do that. So, so anyway, you can, like I say, you can fire it with the bayonet on. We'll, we'll we'll see another use for the bayonet here coming up in a little bit. But the round that a soldier carried, this is a 58 caliber. The 50, it's a Springfield, made by Springfield Armory. Uh, Enfield was imported from England on both sides. It was a 5.77 caliber, it was pretty much the same. <coughs> and this is what the round looked like, right here. I'll pass it around, you can handle it. You can see it's hollow at the bottom. And when you drop it in on top of that powder, you see there's three little grooves cut in the side, right here. And what that does with the rifling of the barrel, spins it as it goes out and makes it much more accurate much more accurate. But you can see the 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 uh, the grooves and that's called a it's actually called a mini ball. It was made, it was invented by a French army captain named Manet and they just said mini. So and and again the reason they called it a ball because ammunition up to this point had usually been a round ball so they just continued using that. And every one of those is an ounce of lead. So think of, we think of medical uh, issues in the Civil War, medical uh, treatment and so on like that. First off, we think that, you know, all these guys that got shot, they had to bite on bullets and so on like that when they were operated on. Not true. Even in the South, the vast majority of operations were conducted with, with ether, with chloroform, with anesthesia, and they actually got very, very good at the hospital stewards, got very good at putting soldiers to sleep during operation. And if you ever see one, it's, it's a, like a big cone that fits over the mouth and nose, and they would put it, they, they would put the ether down in just enough. And actually the death rate from uh, Anesthesia in the Civil War was minuscule, <coughs> minuscule. These, these hospital stewards got so good at, at being able to administer anesthesia that they, they were phenomenal. They, they actually did a, an incredible job. And again, yes, there were <coughs> so many battles where outside the hospital tents, you have these big piles of arms and legs coming out, you know, where they just sawed off arms and legs. You got to, a surgeon got to where he could, from start to finish, amputate a leg in like 10 minutes. Right? From the first time anesthesia goes, makes the cut, cuts it off, sews it back up, everything 10 minutes. Now, the reason 
there were so many amputations done in the Civil War. First off, what, kind, what, what is that bullet made of? Lead. lead. Made of lead, okay. Any guesses on to the muzzle velocity of this rifle? Not very fast. Not very fast. You're right, John. Not very fast. You're probably at eight to 900 feet per second. The average M16 rifle to run comes out at 3,200 feet per second. So when you have this big lead pumpkin hitting the humerus arm bone here, it doesn't go through. It hits it and it, it just shatters it. And there's nothing, I mean, your, your arm is gonna be unusable. And if I don't get that lead out of there, guess what, you're gonna die. You know, you're gonna die of tetanus, you're gonna die of lead poisoning, you're gonna die of gangrene. So again, that's the reason there were, were amp so many amputations done in the Civil War. And again, it's not because the doctors were brutal, it's not because they were cruel, it's not because they were stupid. They had just reached the extent of their medical knowledge at the time. They did notice as the war went on, you know, it's kind of like a revelation. It's like, wow, if we keep these wounds clean, they heal better. That's great. That's great. But there were times when they thought that, that, that pus in the wound was a good sign. You know, they had to get, kind of get away from that. So, but again, the medical knowledge was as good as it could get. And it's uh, the, the chief surgeon of the Union Army in the Civil War, uh, Dr. Letterman, he's still, there's a Letterman Hospital in San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston, which was the Army's medical. But he still, he, they invented the triage system. They didn't invent it, but they kind of perfected it. You know, we all know what triage is, right? That's where we, we, we bring in people, you're, you know, yeah, you're, you can just wait, you're gonna be okay. You, we need to operate on any, any time. You, sorry, there, there, there's a, 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 a vignette in Get, after Gettysburg where uh, field hospital, there was a whole line of men with head wounds, you know, just, you know, they, they just took them, they took them to the woods where the shade was. They were thrusting them. I mean, it's, you know, they try to give them a drink of water or something, but there's nothing you can do. You know, even, even with the medical science we have today, there probably wasn't anything you could do. And don't forget, you know, you know that lack of hygiene, that lack of knowledge, it, it turned, it, it permeated every part of Army life. For every one soldier that died in combat, two died from disease. You know, again, people died of tetanus. They died of lockjaw. I mean, which is which is an awful, awful way to die. You know, there, there's just nothing they could do. So, uh, I mean, and army regulation. You know, it's not like they didn't know. I mean, you had army regulations. You know, books this big. Now we got rooms like this. And, you know, this is the only part of it. <coughs> but back then. You know, it said, like, we know that tetanus occurs frequently around horses. Okay, so, you know, the horses are going to be downstream from where the infantry is. The cavalry and the artillery are going to be down there because we don't want the horses drinking out of the stream and doing whatever in the stream up here and not coming by and not being our drinking water. Okay, so they knew that. They knew, they knew how to lay out camps and everything. But it was just, again, tough to do. Tough to do. Oh, you see me reaching here? We all see those pictures, right? Of people, <coughs> yeah, everybody. It's not just Napoleon, it's everybody. You know why they do that? Because there's a pocket in your coat. I put, I put my handkerchief in here. There's a pocket right here in my coat. So when I'm, you know, we think this looks noble. I just got my hand in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway. So uh, again, uh, you know, soldiers were accurate. To three to four hundred yards with this, um, but at the same time, in the middle of combat, sometimes you don't know if it went off, so you load another one. Sometimes you didn't know, know if it went off. After Gettysburg, they picked, the Union Army picked up fifty thousand muskets on the field. 
and over half of them had, and these are union and Confederate muskets, not just union muskets, over half of them had more than one charge in it. They found one with 16 in it. Can you imagine what happens if that finally does go off? That's not a good day. So, there are even times when reenacting, I'm not sure if it goes off. And I can imagine in that situation where people are trying to kill you and you're scared to death, Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. So. Didn't uh, officers carry a side, sidearms? Usually, yep. Usually officers would carry a sidearm. Officer uh, Remington, Colt, uh, they, they might carry a pistol, might carry a saber. They might decide, you know what, I don't get much out of the saber. The saber was basically used for giving directions, I mean, except in the cavalry, an infantry officer. You know, a lieutenant or a captain probably didn't have much chance to use the saber. He might just decide. And again, officers up to captains, they, they march around with their men. It's not like they had anything different. So they might just decide, you know what? I'm just not toting the saber. So the, were the infantry boys uh, free to purchase their own sidearm? Carry you could purchase a sidearm if you wanted to. Uh, again, thinking of this is accurate. To three to four hundred yards. A pistol is accurate to 25 yards. Mm. Plus, I got to carry all that weight around. So, so, so <laughs> not, not many did. Not you know, not many did. You could. Well, it depended. Like some units, you know, it, 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 like enlisted, you know, privates, you know, sergeants and privates on down. Absolutely forbid. The first sergeant might carry. Yeah. It just it could depend on the unit how strict the colonel was in his discipline. Okay, anything else on the weapon, any, like that? So, okay, all right. We're gonna go into the rations a little bit. Again, this, this is called a haversack. As you can tell, it's kind of beat up. Um, again, I've been reenacting the Civil War a lot more in the war room. Um, my mucket. It could hang over the fire. The way they made coffee back then, you would bring the water to a boil, put your ground coffee. You were issued coffee in the whole bean. Union soldiers were issued coffee in the whole bean. That would keep, that kept uh, speculators from like contaminating it, diluting the coffee. You know, not that, not that ever that ever went on. We've all heard the term shoddy, right? Something shoddy. That term actually came from the Civil War. When stuff was written, it's, it was so bad it would fall apart, like paper shoes. <coughs> it was called shoddy. That's where we get the term from. So anyway, boil the coffee, put the coffee grounds in, let it boil, let it, you know, take it off the fire, sit for a little bit. You could uh, pour a little cold water, settle the grounds, whatever. Um, most soldiers just carried a cup to. To, to drink your coffee out of after you boiled it. I have, you know, if, if you're gonna drink it out of here, you gotta let it sit for a while. I have left my lower lip on here a few times. So, you know, it's just a good idea. This isn't much weight. It, this, this is worth carrying it around. So, so, so soldiers would, now if a soldier wanted to cook, a soldier on the march was issued marching rations. Marching rations were salt pork or bacon, hardtack, and coffee. And you usually issued three days worth. And a, a day's worth of hardtack might be like eight to 10 hardtack a day, a pound of meat a day, and probably a, a quarter to a half pound of coffee a day. But the salt pork, you, know, you had to cook it on the march. Now when you're in camp, you had your, your unit probably designated a mess sergeant, and, and they, you had you were issued rations that you could actually cook in camp, where you had kettles and things like that, soups and stews and all those kind of things. They had a, they had a, a commodity commodity called desiccated vegetables, which was actually like dry vegetables packed together like this. Think of veg, vegetables in a bale of straw, because. It, it was, I mean, I, I guess it wasn't bad, but it, the soldiers called them desecrated vegetables. But it was like dried stuff and you would just 
you know, plus the other thing was rehydrate and so on like that. So, but if you're on the march and you usually had half, you carry half a tent if you set up with your pard and maybe you, you know, you cook bacon or salt pork while he made coffee or something like that. Well, this is, might be one of the frying pans that a soldier used. This is half of a canteen. Okay, canteens leaked, wasn't any good, whatever. You know what? We're going to turn this into a frying pan. So, and actually, you know what? This string really works because, you know, when it's convex like this, the heat comes up in here. This is, this is a pretty, I've cooked stuff in it. This is a pretty decent little frying pan. It really is. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, when it's in fire enough, there's cover, you're not gonna get out of it, but that's, you know, a soldier would actually cook. Uh, you know, cook his uh, meat ration in there. Now, they didn't necessarily have time to cook it. So a lot of times, you had to eat it just the way it came. So, you know, if you were on the march, you know, you didn't have stop, time to stop. You know, if you had to get somewhere, in the battle, in the, the, in leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union Army was catching up to the Confederate Army, which was actually further north. These men had marches of 20, 25, 30 miles a day. And you figure, if you've done marching in June heat, wearing a wool uniform, at the end of the day, you're probably not gonna feel much like hanging around a campfire. I mean, that's the way it is. So, but they would get issued a chunk of salt pork like this. And um, this one does, yeah, it does. One, one obvious reason it's called sow belly on the bottom because the skin is still on it. And you can tell this is a female pig. So, so that, that's what they would get. So. And you know, <laughs> you get that nowadays, and yeah, it's still salty, really, really salty. Okay, coffee beans again. They were issued in the whole bean. What a, what a soldier might do, I could take take my bayonet and leave it in the bag and just crunch them like here. I can I can I can put them in my cup and crunch them like this. I can take butt of my musket and grind it or get a rock or a piece of wood or something like that. But again, this was probably the, the most quality ration that a Union Army soldier had. Because again, the government said, no, no, you're, we're going to buy this in the whole Union. We're not going to get it ground. They, they started drinking instant coffee back then. They called it essence of coffee. But, well, to me, even instant coffee. But again, this is the best quality ration that a soldier has. Hardtack. Looked like this. Now, I admit, I cheat. Because I actually eat this, so I do put a little shortening in it. But, the original hardtack was flour, salt, and water. And even with this, okay, this this is actually left over from last year. I put I put it in a paper bag. I put it on the shelf. You can't kill this stuff. <laughs> but it, it came in big boxes back then. Sometimes the stuff was moldy, you know, because it sat out. And you know, if it sits out in Alabama or Louisiana, it's a little muggy down there. So, uh, but it was, sometimes it had bugs in it. Sometimes, I mean, they, they would try, so if, again, how tired are you? How much work are you gonna put into doing this? A lot of times they would crumble it up and put it in, dump it in their coffee. If there were bugs in it, the bugs would float to the top. You take your spoon, you, you take the bugs out, you, you know, eat the hardtack up and everything else. Other times they just eat it, you know, again. It's funny, as much as this was, one, one soldier had an account of, you know, I've been into my hardtack the other day and 
I ran into soft, something soft, and his car goes, what was it, a worm? He says, no, by God, it was a ten-penny nail. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's funny, after the march to the sea, of course, when Sherman's army got near the coast, all they were eating were rice. They had run out of all the you know, good rations and so on like that. They ran out of rice. But when they got to the sea and the Navy resupplied them, Sherman's even like, heart attack tonight, boys, heart attack. You know, I, I guess it was, you know, it, I, I don't know, it's kind of a love-hate affair with it. But they actually had a, uh, uh, it was a very, uh, very uh, uh, stable, was nourishing. Now, of course, there's no such thing here as fruits or vegetables. But these are marching rations. You get three days and then you get resupplied. So, and if, if it got to the point where you're eating all this, yeah, there were cases of scurvy, so on like that. So, soldier probably carried his silverware here. Sometimes I wonder what I got in here. I got a spoon in here. But, so, you gotta be careful reaching in here. These, these little tines are sharp. It's not like forks today. It's not like forks today. But the soldier was uh, really interested in dental hygiene. I mean, they had toothbrushes back then. <laughs> this is a toothbrush. Actually, this is a pretty decent toothbrush. It's made with horse hair. I mean, it's pretty big though. I mean, <laughs> it's about, you know, it, it's like it hits all your teeth on one side and on top and bottom at once. But it does work. It does work. Remember I talked to you a little bit about uh, uh, uses for bayonets. And all the several hundred thousand wounds that Union surgeons treated in the Civil War, about 1,000 of the wounds were caused by bayonets. Now, of course, maybe you're dead on the spot, but whatever, it wasn't very many. But a real good use for your bayonet is a candle flame. <laughs> so, you stick this in the ground, you write your letter home, you read your mail, whatever. So, so yeah, so it was, again, really good. And you know what? If this burns down at night and all that wax gets over here, your bayonet doesn't because you know, all that wax is covering it, so you're a little lucky there. Because this stuff, I mean, even even around here, this, you know, things can, these can, your musket and your bayonet and so on can, can rust uh, pretty easily. Yes, sir? You talked about uh, the summertime, the, you know, the <coughs> road or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're walking 20 to 30 miles in a march. Mm -hmm. That canteen does not hold enough water. Nope, nope. Was dehydration a real problem at that time? Uh, well, they had they had heat stroke, they had heat exhaustion. There, there were there were accounts of soldiers dying of heat stroke. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you just hope you you found water. Was, I mean, and again, the cavalry is supposed to go out and and do reconnaissance to find out what kind of rivers are you crossing, what kind of. They try to set camps up at night close to water and so on like that. But sure, I mean, if you don't know, but and again, they had maps. They 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 knew the terrain and so on like that. So they would plan it around water. And you're supposed to for a march. You're supposed to march 50 minutes and take a break for 10. March 50, take a break for 10. I mean, the army does that today. Same thing. And we still do that. Yeah, but yes, it could be. Could very well be. So, all right, we're going to get into a few things here. Just wanted to show you, in case it did get cold, which it, of course it did, soldiers were also issued an overcoat or a great coat. Now, soldiers, a lot of times the, the unit would collect these up in the summertime, springtime, but you'd, you'd be issued them again in the, in the fall. But uh, it's, uh, it could also serve as a blanket. But 
I mean, it, it, there, were, there were times when it got cold, obviously, in the south. Um, just leading up to Fort Donaldson in the spring of 1862, uh, there was snow and ice. Um, Stones River at the end of 1862-1863, some of the wounded were actually stuck to the ground because they bled and froze. So that happened as well. I didn't realize I was so efficient here. Bear with me. Now, I'm not going to do it, but you can put all this stuff over top of this. You can put all this stuff over top of this. And again, this is, this is the standard infantry color. Well, it's a standard U.S. Army color. Okay. And it buttons up here. And if it's really, really cold, now I've got this. So uh, when my oldest daughter was younger and she would go to reenactments and it would be cold out, I, I didn't even, I, I knew I would not be able to wear this because she would be having it on. <laughs> it just, it just wasn't, wasn't going to happen. So, so, and again, some soldiers, you saw me carrying it in on the rope. Some soldiers would carry this in lieu of their blanket. They might not even carry a blanket. I just got this because I can, I can, you know, do, do both. I have a coat and I have a blanket. So, so yeah, they, they can do that as well. Now, again, Here's the pack. It's called a double bag knapsack because it's got two sides. Here's a side, here's a side. I might carry half my tent in here. I might roll half my tent up, but it would be fastened at the bottom. This right here. Is my poncho. In case it rains, this is what I put on. Now, I will tell you, if you wear this in the summertime and it's raining, <laughs> now you'll either be wet from sweat wearing it, or you'll be wet from rain not wearing it. In about the same proportion. Because, as you can see, all this is is rubber and canvas. And many, many moons ago, we did a two-mile march into the reenactment of Gettysburg. And the first day, we marched about, I don't know, 12 to 15 miles. And it rained much of the day, and I wore this to start with. And it's like, and it, you know, it was June, July, in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I'm like, forget this, you know, it's like, so, so anyway, um, but usually at night you would lay this down on the ground and would lay the rubber side, <coughs> pardon me, down and would keep the moisture off you a little bit back from the ground coming up. So you would have that. Now, not that a soldier didn't have any free time. Of course he did. Of course he did. So in his pack, he might carry everything that he might want in his free time, or that he might think he, he needs in his free time. He might carry an extra pair of socks. You know, carry, you know, consider it like carrying an extra quart of oil for your car, because every infantryman has got to have good socks. So he might have that. He might, if he was trying to play cards, he might carry a deck of cards with him. Now, it doesn't, you know, gambling back then was considered evil, considered sinful, but a lot of soldiers played cards just to play cards, just to wild the time away, just to play cards. You know what one of the biggest card games in the North in the Civil War was, or among the other soldiers? Euchre, absolutely, Euchre, yep, absolutely. So he might have, but he might carry some cards. He might carry his pocket testament. In the North, in the Civil War, 
the, the United States Christian Commission, the United States Sanitary Commission came into being, the forerunners of the Red Cross. And what they tried to do is they tried to make sure that soldiers were well taken care of. They would pass out Bibles and Bible tracts. They would make sure that soldiers had adequate rations. They would make sure that they try to get soldiers little extras, you know, stuff to write letters home, things like that. Because remember, before when we fought wars, we'd sent a few volunteers like the, uh, the, the war with Mexico. Every state sent a few regiments. Now, we're talking, we're sending hundreds of regiments. The state of Ohio sent 320,000 men to the Union Army in the Civil War. 320, it's, it's the highest per capita of any state in the North. Ohio was the third most populous state in the North. Only New York and Pennsylvania had a greater population. Again, so every one of us in here would have had family members there, sons, brothers, daughters, son-in-law, whatever. We'd had somebody there. So these commissions came into being to make sure that soldiers were adequately taken care of and to provide them extra food and, and so on like that. In fact, in the Civil War, the, the custom of Thanksgiving really started. Abraham Lincoln proclaimed the National Day of Thanksgiving for, uh, I believe, starting in 1863. And it's continued to this day. And they, they did, and all over the North, huge, there were huge drives to provide enough food for all the soldiers to have Thanksgiving dinner. And for those of us who are in the Army, what's the biggest dinner the Army provides for us every year? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. When I was in Bosnia, I invited my British Army counterpart to come over and have Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner at our base. Could not believe, could not believe what the Army provided for us. And it's not like the British Army is like, like the worst, you know, this, like the next to the worst army in the world, but they just couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. And two, there was a lady by the name of Hale, last name Hale, from Hale's Farm, that was very <coughs> instrumental in writing letters to get that <coughs> Absolutely. Now, with all this wear and tear and all this work I gotta do, I might have a button. I might have a hole show up in my sock or my coat or something like that. And what I would need was my housewife. <laughs> Which is a fancy word for sewing kit. I got needles in here, I got thread in here, I got little patches in here, everything. And my my wife actually did make this sewing kit. So, so uh, but yeah, so it might need that. Now, a Union Army soldier was paid $13 a month. Before the Civil War, banks printed their own money. The federal government did not print its own money. So a bank might print a $5 note. This is from the Allegheny County Bank. Okay, this one is the Internal Improvement Office Bank, a dollar. But in the Civil War, we talked about this earlier, First time there was an income tax, many things were taxed to provide money for the war, for revenue for the war. But this is the first time that the Civil War, the federal government printed its own money. So here's a United States dollar with the Secretary of the Treasury, the Honorable Salmon P. Chase from Ohio. And what were these dollars called? Bucks, but what else? Greenbacks. Greenbacks. And why? Because the back's green. I mean, you know, it was a simple time. You know, it was a simple time. So, um, but yeah. And, and a Union Army private was paid $13 a month till May of 1864. He got a raise to $16 a month. So, but he was supposed to get everything else issued to him all his food, all his clothing, his uniforms. Speaking of Salmon P. Chase, he was Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury. Later on became Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. 
But in 1861, there was a camp of instruction that was established west of Columbus called Camp Chase. And a lot of soldiers were inducted there and, and went through what we would call basic training. And of course, basic training back then, there were regiments that were two or three weeks in service and saw their first battles. So it wasn't like a standard what you got today kind of treatment. So anyway, this Camp Chase, <coughs> after it was done with this, became a prisoner of war camp. And if you go to the site of Camp Chase today, you'll see a, a cemetery there. There's 2,260 Confederate soldiers buried there. And there is a monument. I know, because like my wife and I just went about three weeks ago. There's a monument there was put up by a Union veteran about 1900. And he puts a little commemoration of the soldiers that, that died there. And on this monument, there's an arch with a statue of a Confederate soldier on top. And in, a, in the spirit of reconciliation, carved in that arch is the word American. You know, there's a lot that, that goes on today with, you know, demonizing this side or that side or whatever. And, you know, I, I kind of stay away. I, you know, explain a little bit about the, the sentiments of the average northerner at the start of the war. But, you know, the vast majority of southerners didn't own slaves. Didn't own slaves. Um, they, the vast majority of them were just people that just felt they needed to defend their home. I'm not justified, okay? Uh, I, I was a serving U.S. Army officer for a lot of years. I took that oath very seriously. I don't know how you could go back on it, but I'm not putting myself in somebody's place to did. Okay? But, you know, I think today, if, if we start not wanting to have reenactments because of people, you know, if you want to be a Confederate reenactor, it's obvious you want to bring slavery. You know, like, so, you know, I, I think historically speaking, it's very important that we just, you know, put ourselves in their shoes. How would it, how, it's not how I feel in 2020. How did I feel in 1858 or in 1861 when I heard that Fort Sumter had been fired up? Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., great Supreme Court Justice, right? Everybody knows that, right? officer in the 20th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Combat wounded twice, very, came very close to dying. His quote at the start of the war, he says, in our youth, our hearts were touched with fire. You know, that we just felt so importantly that this, you know, this great union that we wanted to preserve or <coughs> we wanted to protect our home from invaders. You know, that, that's just kind of how I, I see it there. I mean, obviously, I had an ancestor buried in Andersonville. My wife had an ancestor that was that lost his arm at the Battle of Bentonville in the 102nd Illinois Volunteer Infantry. But that doesn't mean I can't be a Confederate reenactor if need be. So, does anybody have any questions on any of these pieces? Two. One, in the um, war that I was in, we put bass in our helmet. Very infrequent. <laughs> well, I mean, you would go down, sometimes you'd have a little tub that maybe more than one guy would take a bath in. If somebody wanted to tote the water, or you just go down to the local creek or stream, making sure your drinking water was upstream. <laughs> but that's how you did a bath. The second question is, did you say, and I hope that you didn't, did you say that you had to wear woolen underwear? No, no, you didn't have to wear woolen. What you got issued from the federal government, you got a wool, you got, they, yeah, they issued wool shirts and wool underwear. But the federal government, the, the GI issued this way, were, were wool underwear? It could be, yep. Shorts? Probably, probably my kind of here. Well, remember, remember, I, 
I agree. I, can, I could not agree more. You know, those of us that were out in the field a lot, what kind of underwear did we wear? None. None. We just didn't. But back in this time frame, remember, they weren't used to air conditioning. They weren't used to whatever. I mean, when, when you went somewhere and you went to meet a lady, you had your coat on. It was buttoned up. You had long sleeves. Now, if you were you know, behind the mule, sure, you had your shirt off and that kind of thing. But in society, you wore this. And you weren't used to air conditioning. It was just a different time. I mean, yeah, it, I agree. I agree. It's hard. hard for, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Five, six years ago, we did a week-long reenactment in southwestern Arkansas. 90 degrees every day. We we probably marched to overall about 40 miles in, in that time period. And when I say you realize what you can do without, that knapsack looked like a postage stamp on my back by the time I was done. You know, it was tiny. But you know, you get used to it. You know, you just you're you're never, you know, I'm I was just never completely dry. You know, and again, I've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Panama, going through jungle warfare. I mean, so it, it was just a different way to do it. And these, these men were incredibly tough. You now, know. when the war was over and <coughs> many of them had marched out of the Sherman, you know, mm -hmm. and you talk about how many miles, food, war was over, supposedly, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Did you march the same way and return home, or did you double? <laughs> I mean, did they, did they stay to the same true amount of time and the leadership and well, everything? Not necessary, but at the end of the war, there was a grand review in Washington, D.C. Well, they didn't call it Washington, D.C. back then, they called it Washington City, but anyway. The first day was the Army of the Potomac, the Eastern Army. The second day was Sherman's Army. Well, for Sherman's army to get up to that grand review in time, they force marched them up there. And this is when the war is over. And there were several, if not many, deaths from sunstroke and heat stroke. And you read in guys' diaries, they said what a crime it was that they pushed us and made us do this. Where these guys had survived the war. They survived everything. I'm going home, and I die of heat stroke. North Carolina and Virginia. Secondly, the steamboat flew up. Yeah, so it had. I have to admit that I didn't recognize the Greek Trip in that all. But after I recognized it, I think it would be appropriate for you to tell the story of your entire life to this group because, as I remember, it was probably one of the most extraordinary stories for a police officer, at least an officer, particularly when you went to the school. California to uh, learn languages and so forth. Tell us a little about all that. You're an extraordinary person. Well, thank you. Uh, just a guy doing what the good Lord gave him to do, I guess, is the way I look at it. But when I uh, um, uh, you know, I was on the police department, I uh, through a unfortunate set of circumstances my middle daughter died in 1992. She, she died of cancer, she was five years old. Um, at that time, I had a lot of questions that I wanted answered, so I started attending Liberty University by, uh, uh, back then it was correspondence, now it's online, but back then it was correspondence. And uh, I actually got a master's degree in 1999. I, back in, early, back in my career earlier, I had exchanged shoulder patches with a German police officer in the Army Reserve Unit I was in. I was offered to go a get a chance to go to the Defense Language Institute and learn the language. So I picked German. So it's just like, I just wanted to talk to him a little bit. And I wrote him a letter in German and he said, uh, I didn't even realize that it, it was in German until like halfway through the letter, because I guess it's, it's pretty good. But, and then, uh, then, uh, I retired from the police department, and uh, the last 15 years were quite a bit of going 
overseas, back and forth and doing things. Uh, again, I spent, I was overseas four times for a total of 39 months. Uh, once to Bosnia, twice to Iraq, and then once to Afghanistan. One of my great good, uh, Good fortune was that I was able to teach Army ROTC at Toledo University for two years. Uh, I was the military historian for the department. I taught a 400 level college course on Gettysburg and the Civil War. Uh, they actually paid me to go to Gettysburg for two years. It's like, now, I mean, how can you beat a job like that, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, at the end of 2014, I retired from uh, the Army and uh, I just uh, have been blessed throughout my life to, to be able to do these things and to, uh, to learn. And you know, I, I look back at my dad and, and how he showed me those things way back when. And I've always just been interested in this. And uh, it's, it's been a, a great life. Uh, Wadsworth is a great place to work and live. Uh, and uh, I, I couldn't. Remember, Lou Gehrig said, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Well, that's me. Um, you know, sorry, Lou, I got you beat. But, um, I mean, it's, been, it's always a pleasure to come in and to talk to the people that are serious about this and are interested in it. And, uh, I, uh, the reason I wanted you to mention this is that I want people here to understand that our policemen are not just strong armed people, but we have highly intelligent and you and several others of us in the force who were actually college graduates mm -hmm. and had this kind of experience. So you are one of our finest. And thank, you. thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure working for you, too. Pardon? It was a pleasure working for you. Too. Well, you didn't work for me. Well, <laughs> you know, know, you were, yeah. It's, it's, it's like when you're soldiers, you're still working for the president. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. When your family mailed you a package, how long would it take to get to wherever your troops were? Boy, it, it could take a while. It could take a while. Because, uh, I mean, and they, the Army was, was pretty diligent about trying to get it there. But if you were, say you were in camp over winter, you know, probably, probably not too long. But if you were on the march, and they, there are many instances of, <laughs> where the mail might catch up to you in like two months. You know, a letter was written two months ago. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, you know, it was just a okay. So, and there, there were instances where they would dig into a, maybe your family would send you a package. Well, whoever was handling the mail might dig into the package and see if there was a cake in there or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> in fact, there's a great book out there. It's actually written by a an Ohio soldier that's called Cy Clegg in his part. It's written on his account. He writes as a fictional account of a soldier from Indiana, but you can really tell it's his own experiences. And it, uh, Cy, who's the main interest of the story, his family sends him a package of cake. And Cy was a boy like to eat, so he's anticipating this and everything, and he gets the cake, <coughs> and it's all tore up. There's a few crumbs left. And there's a little note in there that says, this is bully cake. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Very good. You're, you're, talking, Ken, you're talking about uh, the way people remember the Civil War and, and so on, and the honor that they had from the people that fought in it. Mm -hmm. um, at an instance in 1970, I was with the Ohio National Guard. We were in Virginia, and uh, Virginia, Sergeant and I had a duty that took us into the night quite, quite long. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, a, in the middle of the night, we're standing around and just talking. And he looks over at me and says, Would you mind if I looked at your weapon? I go, No. And uh, I cleared it. It was an M16, mm -hmm. and I handed it to him. And he looked at it, and I held his M1 while he was looking at it. And what he said to me, You could have knocked me down with a feather. Back because you Yankees always did have better guns. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you another one, John. I was in the in the National Guard in 1996, and a lot 
uh, the National Guard was tasked to go down to do security at the Atlanta Olympics. So I was, I was a first lieutenant at the time. So I went down with a bunch of us because we were doing a leader's recon. And they said, and, and so in the Georgia Army National Guard was one of the guys, one of the units that was very much in charge of it. And, and we're in here in this huge hall and they're getting ready to do all their briefings and everything. And they're like, I don't know if we want y'all Yankees down here tonight. <laughs> Last time he was here, you burned the place down. <laughs> <laughs> typical than we think. First yeah. off, I was horrified. The, the, the draft was, this was the first time there was a draft in this country because that's a conscription. But, for a lot of people to realize, the Confederacy had a draft before the, the North had a draft. They started drafting people early in 1862. And basically, the draft was a way to force you to volunteer. They didn't draft a huge amount of people, but uh, uh, if you could pay $300 to a substitute, you could, you, you could not go unless you unless it came you came up again. But yeah, okay. or if you owned, I believe, X number of slaves. Yes, in the South, in the 20, South. 20. If you owned 20 slaves, you were exempt in the South. But in the North, it was $300. And President Lincoln actually paid a substitute to go for him. Not that he would have had to go either. But other people that, one other person would go that paid a substitute, John Meewa. I had a sim I had a similar um, family history, and I didn't know how to feel about it either. Um, I have a receipt for it. it was really? Actually, yeah. That's interesting. It was an application, and then there was a, some mm -hmm. sort of a proof of payment. Well. Yeah. yeah but I it really looked organized. Yes, it looked organized. Yeah. 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 Legal, I guess. Yeah. Does it being legal make it right? That's for each person to decide. I guess. So, so I don't know. I don't know. Anything else at all? Anything. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.